Hi, everyone. I am back, and thank you for joining me today in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. Louis Schaefer started acting at the age of 15 and graduated from the Yale Drama School. Daytime fans know her from her memorable roles on The Edge of Night, Search for Tomorrow, and on Ryan's Hope, where she played Ray Woodard, a role that earned her a Daytime Emmy Award. Louise returned to her first love of writing and began a successful second career when she found herself as an unemployed actress in her mid-40s. She began writing scripts for daytime soaps, but soon followed her dream and wrote her first novel, The Three Miss Margarets. It was followed by the ladies of Garrison Gardens, Family Acts, Serendipity, and Looking for a Love Story. You daytime fans have been asking for Louise to return ever since we had trouble back in March, and she is here today. Please welcome Emmy Award winner Louise Schaefer. Louise. Yes, sir. How are you? Thank you so much for being here. I'm happy to be here. Well, I fans, like I said, fans have been begging for you to come back since we tried this in March. And okay. I'm so glad you uh that you committed so, to the That is so nice of thank you. <laughs> well, isn't it? Talk, thank you. That's they're, lovely. They're, they are they are there, and I have lots of questions from them as well. But isn't oh, that good. amazing? Oh, good. When when you think about how long ago your roles were, to think about the fact that you you know you are still in people's hearts. Yeah. Isn't I, that? I, it, <laughs> could you ever have imagined that those roles, you know, in the late sixties, early seventies? people would still be talking about today? Well, you got to start with, the only thing I ever wanted to do was be an actress, right? Mm -hmm. And if audiences don't take in what you're trying to do, I mean, it's a real partnership with an audience, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if they don't, they don't, open up to what you want to try to give then you don't get to do it so to me I mean I have always just wished I could thank everybody individually for letting <laughs> me have the career I wanted to have because well, I, can... I wouldn't have had it if it hadn't been for them you can certainly <laughs> say thank you because they are listening right thank now you. <laughs> thanks so much after all this time Thank you. Yeah. It's crazy. So so you were 15 when you started. Yeah. Was it was it um movies or television that you watched? What prompted I your was I was in Connecticut. Um there was a summer stock company. Run down old uh really on its last legs. And I got a part in an old Miller drama. I seem to do a lot of those. I did one at Yale too. Um, <laughs> very campy. I, I seem to have something for that even at 15. It was called Mrs. Weeks of the Cabbage Patch. And um, I did that for three weeks, yeah. Wow. And, um, and and you 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 were bit you were bit you had the bug. Oh no! I I decided at the age of twelve that I wanted to be an actress. And my father was a businessman. He was kind of tough, actually. So um, I was twelve, and I decided that that's what I wanted to do with my life. So um, I got a, a a copy of Theater Arts. I, I got a subscription to theater arts and I did theater arts for a couple of years. And then I wrote out a business plan for him of how I felt my training should go and what my projection was for my career. And he had an office in the home and I went in and I sat across from him. He was on one side of his desk and I was on the other. And I explained to him how uh, my career was going to work and wow. what his part would be. And he said that he would take it under advisement. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, we were kind of formal back then. Wow. And, 
<clears throat> and then he uh, took me to my audition, which was my first step at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts for their teenage program. And um, then that summer, I did Mrs. Wiggs. And this is not a, uh, oh, wow, gosh, there's so much to talk about. Um, <laughs> So he took me to my first audition. My father loved the theater. I had I grew up in around New Haven, which was a big theater town, and I started going when I was three. My folks figured I was, you know, smart enough to understand, and of course I could step that way. So I just went. Anyway, he took me in for the audition, and. Um, and he had all, and then I got into the academy. I did the show in summer stock over the summer. He drove me back and forth every night for the three weeks. He gave me uh, an opening night present, a piece of jewelry, which I still have. And then a week after my first class at the academy, my dad died. And uh, my mom, who was very worried about me going into New, ha into New York on my own at 15. Um, I can imagine. Uh, yeah, we sat down and talked about it. And she said, well, your father felt that you could handle it. So I guess I do, too. So, um, so that was the beginning of it for me with um, dad, dad got to at least see me do that. Um, and one of the women uh, in the show, Mrs. Wiggs, was then in The Music Man. And I stopped by one day after class at the American Academy. And, um, and she had, he had driven her home because she lived in New Haven and I lived nearby. And, and, um, and I told her that I was going to be an actress, um, that I, I was coming into the city and doing this and I was going to be like her. And I hung around backstage at the 46th Street Theater. Wow. And you, and yeah. you certainly did. Let me just ask you, do you have your phone near you? Because I would... Yeah. You, I would just move it away. It might be giving us a little feedback if you can just. Okay. Yeah. Does that help? I turned I, it off so we I, wouldn't have one of those things where I'm scrambling. Yeah, I, I think so. Because now I don't yeah. hear myself. Um, the American Academy, you know, if, if you would think today, is there something you uh, learned there that you think you took everywhere else in every role? Not there so much, but I started coaching with the head of the drama department at Yale when I was 16, and I could drive myself. I mean, you were so young doing all of these things. It's incredible. Well, I didn't want to do anything else, and I was very, very weird. <laughs> I, I was a total misfit. I mean, first of all, I was at least a foot taller than every boy I knew, starting at about the age of 10. By the time I got to be 12 and 13, some of them had caught up with me, but I was much taller. Um, I was very heavy. I wore um, orthopedic Oxfords because I had flat feet and glasses. And um, because of my family, I, I never listened to Elvis Presley because I was too busy listening to La Boheme. We started going to the opera when I was a kid. And I, as I said, I went to every show that came through New Haven at the Schubert. So I, um, I didn't belong. And the only thing that I could figure out that I wanted to do was be an actress. I seemed to know how to do that, I felt. 
Well, I think, <laughs> I think the fans watching today would certainly agree. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> anyway, but I would like to tell you, because it is important um, to anybody that ever wants to do anything creative, uh, this very Victorian acting coach. I mean, she was like a, an Oxford Don, right? And uh, I was working <clears throat> on a scene for a, a competition. And um, she, she, uh, she gave me, this was now maybe close to a year after my father was gone. And she gave me Emily's goodbye scene from our town. Goodbye to coffee and sunflowers and sleeping and waking up. The goodbye scene. And I was a pretty stoic kid. I hadn't cried a lot about my dad. But that scene did it. And she knew my history. And she knew that would connect. And it did. And she said to me afterwards, do you understand? You're one of the blessed ones. Nothing in your life will ever be truly bad because you will always find a way to use it. Because acting will always be your fist to the sky. Wow, powerful. powerful. Yeah, she said that to me when I was quite young. And by the way, I won the competition. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> I really I did. <laughs> um, the guy that I was hoping would ask me out didn't because I aced him. But I did win the competition. <laughs> Which did you rather have, the guy or that are winning the competition? <laughs> Do you know what's really awful about me? I really <laughs> wanted to win the competition. I believe that. He was you, cute. You, <laughs> you wanted was to be adorable. an actress. You wanted to be an actress. Yeah, you know, I really you, did. You've really had some great daytime roles. Yeah. Are you able to pick a favorite? Yeah. Um, and for Ryan's Hope fans, I, I'm sorry. It was Josie Serena on Edge. And, and I, you know, the, the fans, um, I'll get to that, but they made, you know, they sent me some links and I watched those courtroom scenes, which blew me away. Blew oh, me good. away. I'm glad. I mean, incredible. They weren't too much? No, they were incredible. And it, it's so incredible good. to watch daytime from back then because of how long those scenes were. And yes, I, wasn't that wonderful? Yes. I mean, and that that's why they're more impressive in some ways because of what you had to be able to do in those scenes. <clears throat> is that why, I mean, you played such, you know, uh, you know, uh, what is the uh, word for that character? Um, sorry, I'm blanking on the- um, they, they kind of, they, they um, multiple personality. Per personality, right, multiple yeah, personality. It, it, it was a kind of a Henry Slesser, fudging of multiple personality. There was a lot of poetic license in it because I did a lot of research on the actual condition. But then, you know, you let that go and you just play what you got. Right. Um, well, well, one of the fans, Floyd, that's why I wanted to mention, he sent me the episode. He says he thought it was one of the top 10 episodes of all time in soaps. And another oh, fan, Floyd, Al thank you. Oh, <laughs> and another how fan, Alan. You're gonna make me cry. <laughs> another fan, Alan, asks, "What do you recall about those scenes on the witness stand?" Well, first of all, let me tell you one of the things that I really loved about my year on search was Annie Blood and Lois Kibbe. I think sometimes there are people that set the tone on a set, and those were two great women who made people feel welcome, who, if they liked some work you'd done, never, ever failed to come up and say so. 
They were gracious. And the set was one of the kinder sets that I've ever been in. That having been said, what I really loved before those courtroom scenes, it was live. Oh my God. I, I, right. Those, that's what I mean. Those scenes are so long that the material. But, you know. but the show was live. I believe those were taped, but we did that show live. So, <laughs> for instance, at one point, my can I was supposed to crack a mirror with my candlestick hitting it. And the mirror wouldn't crack. <laughs> and I'm, I'm standing there and hitting it because it's got to be there for the next scene. And I see two of the stagehands come racing across the studio and they're bracing the set like physically with their bodies because I'm hitting it so hard I'm going <laughs> to knock the set down. I love that stuff. I love it when that happens. The, they, I had a wig change, and there were a couple of times when I was running across the studio and the hairdresser was pulling one wig off and fixing my hair underneath it. It was fun. It was just fun. What do I remember about this? Well, those? and that's interesting that you picked that role, even though you won the Emmy for Ray. Yeah. I loved Ray, and Claire let me have my head with Ray in the beginning. She she really, um, we talked about Ray before I went on the air. Claire I, Labine, I, right? Yeah, I had, excuse me, um, I had um, worked for her on Where the Heart Is. And I was out in LA and I'd just done a show for Norman Lear and um, all that glitter, oh, fans are asking about that too. We'll get to that. <laughs> I have to tell you, um, I, I hate to say this because I have a lot of people, including family that live out in LA. I hate it. Um, first of all, you've got to drive to your auditions. There's one person in the world who's a worse driver than me, and that's my late mother. And... Um, I gave up my license as a public service when I moved to Manhattan. And um, by the I was going to kill somebody if I stayed out there long enough trying to get to auditions. It was either me or somebody else. Um, nobody wants me on the road. So you had to drive to your auditions, and I never understood them. I never understood L.A. Um, one time I had to read for the part of a nun who was having a uh, conference with her mother's superior. And um, the feedback on, you know, I wore the little blouse with the bow and I no makeup. And, and the feedback on that audition was, she doesn't have any sex appeal. So I said to my manager, um, as a fallen away Catholic, allow me to tell you <laughs> how much I could never play a nun coming on to her mother superior. Okay? Just let me tell you that. <laughs> let me tell you that. Yeah. Um, and were, I don't you understand. Were gonna yeah, you were going to tell the Clara Labine story. Sorry, I interrupted. Okay, you. anyway, yes, you have to keep me on track. I'm not a linear thinker. I'm terribly <laughs> sorry. I have no bullet point things anyway. Do not worry. Claire. So Claire called me and she said, hi. Um, I was out there and I was watching Ryan's. And I loved it because it was different from anything we'd ever done in daytime. I mean, first of all, there was all the ethnic stuff. Everybody knows all of this. I, I saw a scene with Nancy and John and it was, she was sick with a cold or the flu and it was a love scene. I mean, in and around her coughing and sneezing and the chicken soup, it was a love scene. 
And that was so quintessentially Claire Labine. Um, and I watched it and, and I watched the way the girls were dressed and Nancy did a scene when she was perched on a desk somewhere. She, I mean, people didn't do that kind of thing in daytime. And I really wanted, I kept thinking, I want to be on that show. I wish I were on that show. And the thing with Norman Lear had died a tragic, horrible death. And, you know, I was still out there trying to be a star. And I, I just wanted to go home. And, you know, when you're in a place and you keep talking about when I get back to America, you know you don't belong there. And um, Claire called and she said, I want to bring um, a bitch onto the show. And I was thinking I'd like to have the Louise Schaefer rich bitch. <laughs> and I said, oh, baby, have you got it? And then we talked and I said, Claire, this time, what I want to play is someone who has absolutely no consciousness of ever doing anything wrong. She simply wants what she wants and goes for it. And if somebody happens to get in the way and she said, that's their problem. And I mean, looking back on it now, what I wanted to play was a sociopath. But what we both understood as girls who had been raised to always be aware of how other people are feeling and how the consequences of something we might do or say were in some way going to hurt them or or you know god forbid we should wound somebody or offend somebody she understood what i wanted i wanted that freedom not to be evil or bad just driven which i think i was anyway and yeah, I think I think I can say that about myself. So we um so she said, You got it. So I came home and uh I went on the show. That's that's awesome. Well, another fan, Matthew, says Ray was such a great character, a wonderful example of a powerful woman who was in charge of her life. Were there women you knew in your life that you that influenced your portrayal, he wants to know? Not really. She was the woman I wished I could have been. She was the woman I wish a lot of the women of an older generation could have been. Mm -hmm. Um. I have a very smart mom and very smart aunts, and they did very, very well. They, two of them were professional women. Um, Mama ran a business, but they never had that freedom. Mm -hmm. And I didn't either. I, I was a people pleaser. And um, she was a fantasy for me. Ray was a fantasy for me. Well, fans fans loved it. Another fan, Roy Bowen, encouraged me to watch a scene between you and Helen Gallagher that I watched yesterday. Um, good, He said, good versus evil, a lot of bad blood in past history. Told me to watch the facial and the body gestures. He said the confrontation was a long time coming. Um, and he, like Floyd had considered the other scene, he considered by, thinks this one is, one of the top 10 greatest scenes of all times. And it, it's, a scene, it's a scene in the bar uh, in uh, Ma uh, Maeve's home when you come in uh, looking, I can't remember uh, for your, the guy who was uh, giving you the subpoena, um, but it was another great scene of you going toe to toe with Helen Gallagher. What do you recall about working with Helen? Well, you know, I took singing lessons with Helen 
Um, she was your teacher or you took yeah, them together? Yeah, she, she had a singing workshop and she was wonderfully supportive of people who were interested in learning musical comedy technique. I, excuse me again, I'm sorry. That's okay. She, um, what do I remember? Helen's performance as Maeve, I thought, was just an object lesson in restraint. Mm. And she did something else. Um, you know when a really good actor brings the entire backstory and biography of their character with them when they walk on stage? You kind of know how they grew up. You know what they're, you know all the things that you're not seeing on the screen that make up a human being. I don't remember a lot about those specific scenes. Oh yeah, no. I just was curious about working with her, but I love that you, you had class Oh uh, yeah. Oh yeah. You know, and you, you, and I yeah, she she was a great mentor. Um uh, but she's she I think it was because what she did was so strong and so grounded. Yeah, it it brought your game up. I do remember that. I remember feeling like yeah. Oh, and the game was the in those scenes that Roy sent me, the game was on between the two of you. It was, you know, it, you could just feel the uh, the animosity you both had towards each other. It, it was something. Good. And, and, you know, back in March, you were supposed to join your daughter, your on-camera yes. daughter, <laughs> yes. and, and Michael on the show. Do you remember meeting both of them for the first time? Oh, God, Kelly. Kelly, oh. <laughs> okay, um, uh, my job was supposed to be over on that show. I was brought in to screw up the, the uh, Frank Jill story. That was the thing, and I was supposed to be gone. But by then I'd met the guy I wanted to marry and I wanted to stay on the show. And um, Jeffrey Lane, who had started out as a script guy, as a timer guy, yeah, script guy, and then had worked his way up to becoming one of the writers on the show, came up with the idea that Ray should have a daughter that she'd never acknowledged. And it kept me on the show. So anyway, um, I walk in and there's this girl <laughs> and she's like, a teenager and she's obviously very, very frightened. And we're going to work uh, together and we're going to share a dressing room and we're sort of cordial. And then we get out on the set and I realized this kid just kind of draws things in. She has charisma like you cannot believe. There's nobody else on the set when she's there. She's just got whatever that thing is. And uh, we play the scene and we go. I go home and I say to Roger, uh, well, as long as this girl wants to stay on the show, I got a job. So don't worry about a thing. We can get married. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and a few weeks in, um, I'm, <laughs> as you can probably tell by now, I'm a fairly intense human being. And uh, that makes me a very high energy and, if I let it loose, intense actor. And when you're on camera, sometimes if you're working with somebody whose style is much more laid back, mm. 
-hmm. and go back, you can start to look like you're chewing the scenery. I mean, you can start to look like a really bad actor. And that's not to say that either a laid back kind of person or an intense driving person is wrong. It's just two different kinds of styles and cameras pick up on stuff like that. And I had learned over the years to watch it. And I was sure, I mean, she was 18, 17 years old and, and brand new in the city. And so I was going to, okay, she's terrific and she's funny and she's smart and I'll pull my punches a little bit. But then we got into a scene and I just hit one over the net and the thing comes barreling back at me. <laughs> and I go, oh, oh, fuck, this is going to be fun. <laughs> you know? I mean, this is going to be, and it was fun working with Kelly. That was the big thing. It was just fun. I love that story. I mean, it sounds like she was a lot like you at that age. I don't know. I think, I think there's a connection between us in all seriousness. I think we, we are the same and I'm not going to go into detail because she's not here to defend herself. And, you know, um, I can say about me that there is a mix of very soft, very vulnerable, it's easy to hurt me, but I'm also tough. And there's a mix of kind of cerebral and emotional. And uh, I think that that is what I think, part of what I bring. And, and oh, in a kind of, showman thing but also being very shy and introverted and I think um, that that's what I know I bring to the table and Kelly would have to tell you she thinks that's what she brings to the table but I you are still friends to this day yeah oh yeah 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 she um she called me on. She she we, we actually just texted a couple of weeks ago. It helps. Um, it helps to text to text instead of talk because mm -hmm. of the time difference. She's doing real well, by the way. She's she's got a lot of stuff going on. She right does. Now. I, I saw that she had just done something too. Um, and then she looks then, like a million bucks. She does. She looks like a million. Oh my bucks. god. And then they throw Michael into the mix. Oh, yes. My beloved Michael. Yes, I love him. Michael did... You know, to... <clears throat> you know at the time that Michael was, was on our show, what I always felt guys who did daytime didn't get enough, um, I, I've said this before, didn't get nearly enough appreciation for the very narrow road they walked because it was a time of kind of the, the kind of masculine type that was out there that was the star of nighttime was kind of terse and not very talkative. And, you know, basically a lot of those careers, let's be honest, you know, they, uh, their stuntmen should have gotten the Emmys, not them. Um, you know, cause they got them for the car chases, not for any real acting ability. And our guys, had to pull off scenes that were relationship driven. Mm -hmm. They had to, they had to be able to handle, as we all did, large wads of of um, backstory dialogue 
They had to be able to play, but mostly they had to be able to play relationships and still come off as romantic leading men. And it took a really smart man to pull that off. It took a smart actor to do that. And Mike was one of the really smart, very smart guy. And, and of course, physically beautiful. Doesn't hurt. And- um, Does it hurt that, that mother and daughter, you know, both, both had mother. And, and <laughs> yeah, and, and playing the guy that, that was manipulating the one and in love with the other, yeah. That was a road to home. <laughs> it was. It was good a story. I mean, do you do you have any recollection of the scene where you caught Kimberly and Michael in the act? I don't remember that scene. I do remember the scene where I had to slap Kelly because I didn't want to slap her. I didn't want to hurt her, and I didn't know how to pull the punch. And we, uh, it was late. We'd gone way over, and it was like about nine o'clock at night. <laughs> and Kelly was finally like, "Just hit me, just please, God, hit me. I don't care. I want to go I home. Care what you do to me, <laughs> just hit me. Get us out of here." Um, I don't that's, remember that scene. No, I really. That's don't. okay. That's okay. Was it tough taking over a role from another actress when you joined Search for Tomorrow playing Stephanie oh, White? Oh, Jesus. Yeah, that was, that was the mistake of a lifetime. But, um, cause... Taking the role uh, from someone, you know, I mean, that happens all the time. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, Marie's some... shoes weren't even cool from her feet and I was stepping into them. It was a crazy decision. Um, I needed the job and I needed the money. And that's why I did it. Mm -hmm. um, and to be really honest with you, I think it was one of those network things mm -hmm. where they really don't value what an actor brings to a part. So they just looked at it and said, oh, Marie Cheatham plays a rich bitch. Louise Schaefer plays a rich bitch. You know, Marie, we're getting, we're going to ask Marie to leave. And we'll just slam Schaefer into it. Nah, the audience won't ever notice the difference. And the fact is that Marie and I are very different actors, I think. She brings something I could never bring, that, that wonderful kind of, well, first of all, she's, you know, She's a very sexy lady, and she brings all that flirtatiousness, which I don't have any of. And she she has that kind of sly humor. I mean, it was ridiculous to put me in that part. And if I hadn't really needed the money, I never would have done it. Never in a million years would I have done it. And if you are going to replace someone as beloved as Marie Cheatham, you, you really need to give the audience months before you do that to them, I think. Right, right. I don't know about, do you think so? Yeah, I mean, I know what you're saying. Sometimes it depends, you know, sometimes these th things happen in the middle of like, you know, big story and they have to do it. Other times it is, you know, better when there's a break so that fans can yeah. adjust it to, yeah, to I mean, it. you know, people yeah. adored her. You, you're you're going to send another actress in? It's ridiculous. It's a lost It's really cost. like throwing you to the wolves. Well, you know, I was a big girl and I guess I could have gone back to waiting <laughs> tables, but I, uh, you know, um, no, I it, it was an it was a bad a bad move career wise. But it was so it was about twenty years later that you took that role from your first time on search. What was it oh, like? God, yeah. What was it like returning to to you know one of your first? Well, <clears throat> it was very different because when I when I left search when I did search the first time. And um, what I remember about that 
is that I spent my first six weeks wearing a blue bathrobe because the girl who had played Emily before me was like about five foot two and maybe a size four. So her entire wardrobe did not fit me. And they had to wait until uh, the new budget before they could buy me some clothes. Um, so I had to wear her bathrobe, which to her had gone to the floor and on me, it was a kind of a mid-calf affair. <laughs> anyway, that's what Emily wore. Um, what was it like? I'd been terrified of Mary the first time we did the show. Mary Stewart. Yeah, really scared of her. Um, I mean, she was a goddess. Um, Joe. But by the time I went back, she was... Um, Maybe she'd mellowed a little, and I was a lot less frightened of other actors. So I got to know her. And we shared a love of music and singing. She sang. And we also shared a love of writing. Mm -hmm. Mary wrote a teleplay, which was done uh, with Tyne Daly and Jenna Rollins um, from a short story, or I think she wrote the short story about her own experience in helping a homeless woman. And she, we talked a lot about how much we both liked writing. I hadn't even started writing at that point, but I was inching toward with it. That's great. And then Lisa Peluso played your daughter there. Is that yeah. right? Yes. What was, Le what was Lisa like back then? Do you remember? Yeah. I, I do remember. I think... I think at first, and, and you would have to ask Lisa about this, I, I, I think at first it might have been jarring because I think she and Marie had gotten very close. And, and, you know, in the same way that I would have had a lot of trouble. Right. No, I wouldn't right. have had a lot I, of trouble, I, but it wouldn't have been easy to. It, it, adapt if to there a was new somebody Kimberly. else who took Kelly's role. Yeah, if, if to a new Kimberly. I, I, you know, you do. If you're playing a mom and daughter, if you give to it and you give into it, um, that can create a real bond. Um, I think, I think I, I felt like Lisa was ready to move on, mm. and I didn't know if she was going to or not. But she'd been there quite a while, and she'd grown up on the show. And she really was a grown up at that point. And she was and, quite beautiful. And I, I wondered when she was going to cut the cord. That's what I remember. Yeah. It had nothing to do with what she was giving me. But I kept wondering, when is this girl going to go Let, and try? Uh, her, her wings, you know, clip her yeah, wings. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I she'd been on the show since she was a baby, I think. Yeah, since she was a young, yeah, a young woman. Yeah, and then yeah. Michael, Michael and you worked together again at Search, right? Not as much. I didn't really work with Michael. I worked with Peter Haskell. But Michael was there at the same time, right? A Michael little... was there at the same time. I didn't have a lot to do with him. But Pete had come over from Search, and he was he was their kind of silver fox. <laughs> over, uh, okay, come over from Ryan's. So yeah, and he was their kind of silver fox. I love that. Uh, fans were also talking about you playing Erica Kane's evil stepmother, Gloria Kane, on All My Children. Yes. Was that fun? Oh yeah, yeah, that was <laughs> a lot of fun. That was that was um, Claire Beckman played my daughter, and boy, there's an actress. She's got a theater now in Brooklyn. Amazing. Oh, um, I, need to, I need to reach out to her. I think, if I'm not mistaken, oh, do, I do. think she's the, she took over 
a role from Julianne Moore on As the World Turns, if that's the right actress I'm thinking of. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I watched By her way, when she was on a, I watched her when she was on As the World Turns. I remember her. She was great. Do you ever do you ever work with anybody that did Dark Shadows? I am doing a Dark Shadows at the end of the month. Uh, Mary O'Leary, I don't know if you know that name. She's a producer and director who wrote and directed a documentary about Jonathan Frid. And, ah. and we're going to do a show about the documentary <coughs> with Mary and Marie... Um, Wallace. Yes, Marie Wallace. Good, from, I was about to say... If you yeah. can get a hold of Marie, do she's an old friend and, and oh, she's uh, gonna do. She's doing the show September thirtieth. Bravo! Yeah. good yeah. for you, Ellen. Yes, she, she big, is. Big, big good for you. Yeah, yeah, she, she she is. Well, you've mentioned the writing. We have to talk about the writing. So yeah, yeah. You and you and um, Mary Stewart uh, is it Mar not Mary Stewart? Yeah, Mary, 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 Mary Stewart. We're talking about your love of writing. Where did your love of writing start? Because you you said you when you and Mary were talking about it, you hadn't really done it yet. But where did your love for it stem from? Was there, you know, were you a big well, reader? Well, I started. You, were a kid? I, and you, you remember what I told you about myself as kind of like the quintessential wiener child. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I started writing before I was acting because in there were no drama clubs in my, I mean, I used to do shows, but um, so I wrote when I was very, very young. I mean, like 10 and stuff. And then I realized I, I wanted to act, but I, so I kind of, I, I've always loved my imaginary friends. I, I really like them. They're much nicer sometimes than real humans. Um, so I, I, um, I would say I, was a, I wrote first, then I stopped doing it. And I focused totally on I wanted to be an actress and I was going to do that. And then somehow it started seeping into me that I would go on an audition and I would see, you know, I'd, I'd be told, this is what this is all, this character and this scene is all about. And I go, okay, fabulous. They're doing what I want to say. They're, they, this is something I really want to, to deal with. And then I'd get the sides and it was like, nah, that's not what I want. That's not what I want to say. That character isn't, nah. So I started realizing that I probably wanted to write my own stuff. Hmm. And I wrote an audition piece for myself, um, which I used to love to do, which was basically making fun of the audition process. Genius. <laughs> um, what? Genius. Yeah. Unfortunately, when you're auditioning for people and you put in lines like, um, oh, no, no, that's okay. I'll, I'll wait until you finish unwrapping your sandwich. Um, you're making fun of them in a way that some of them don't have a sense of humor. Right. They don't appreciate. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was not one of the more strategic moves of my life. But anyway, I, I wrote that thing and I enjoyed doing that a lot. And I was inching toward starting to write. Um, by the time I was doing Stephanie. Yeah. And then how did you, you wrote for daytime, correct? Yes, I did. <clears throat> May I add something? Yes. I hated it. <laughs> what was, was it hard? Is that, what, what did you hate? I, um, 
writing for daytime is a true collaborative effort. You know, there's the head writer, and then there are the outline writers, and then there's script writers. I, I never did anything but script writing. And I know some brilliant people who did phenomenal scripts. And they are really fine, fine writers. But you got to be able to play on a team. And I just do not work and play well with others. And it's not um, your story either. No. You, know, you, ha you have to go by their guidelines because you're, you're the script writer for the head writer, basically. I mean, I cannot tell you the kind of creativity and discipline it takes to keep that alive and vital and in the voices of the characters that have already been created by somebody else and at the same time follow the dictates of that outline to I always wanted to do my own thing mm. and I when I was acting I had enough I had enough leeway as an interpreter that I could when I was writing for daytime I always I, I always felt like I had to stick too close to the outline. I couldn't give it my own thing. And very often, I didn't write well as a result. Which show were you doing it for? Oh, Lord. They tried me on a lot of them. I did Ryan's for a while. Claire gave me a job. That's and then awesome. I did As the World Turns. And I did Loving, and I did, uh, what else did I do? And I did some show out of LA where we were in the middle of a story meeting and the head writer said, um, okay guys, we gotta stop, security's at the door. And somebody in the background said, what's going on on the set? why are the Pinkerton guys showing up on the set? And the show had been canceled. Nobody bothered to tell them. Mm -hmm. And they were literally being hustled out of the building while we were trying to plan the next week's script. Which show is this? I don't know. I can't remember. It was one that Mary Ryan Munisteri was the head writer for. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, it was, it, that was, it was L.A. I tell you, I'm sorry, but the Hollywoods are weird. <laughs> so you didn't like it. Is there um, something you remember, like a favorite character on any of the shows that you in, liked writing? You know, was there one that might stand out in your, your mind that you enjoyed writing for? I think I was too scared and too nervous about, I've been an actor on a show, okay? I knew what it was like when a writer came on who did not know your character mm -hmm. and fucked with your voice. And I didn't want to do that to any actor. So I think I I liked writing for Catherine Hayes. Ah, Kim uh, Hughes. Liked writing for her. Um, I lo love Catherine Hayes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was. She is a, that was that's, an, that's a great actress as well. That was an. That was a, For some reason, I twigged onto her voice. I think. Um, who else did I like writing for? Oh, Martha. Yeah, Lily. 
Oh she, yeah. She, yeah, yeah. That was a that was a yeah, yeah. L I could Lily, another great character. Right. Two two very different characters, but great ca yeah, I mean, they, char they... character characters. They were Kim Hughes is a character and and Lily Walsh is a character. Yeah. They were they were so strong for me that I, I could figure out what to do for them that I didn't feel was going to violate their characters in any way. I mean, like yourself, very strong women, like Ray, very strong women. Yeah, yeah. Very strong women. So so yeah. your first novel was The Three Miss Margarets. Yep. How, you know, so you walked away, I assume, from daytime? <clears throat> yeah, I, um, no, I got fired. From writing. I usually got fired. Um, <laughs> okay. M I, many, I many got, do. Many do. Yeah. I, um, most people, I, I never got fired as an actress, but I got fired regularly as a writer, which should tell you something. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I, I had, uh, I had ghosted a book for someone who shall remain nameless. And, uh, I got a chunk of money when that book was made into a movie of the week. Um, and I do wish I could put that sucker on my resume, but I can't. But anyway, um, I, I goes to this book for this guy and it was made into a movie of the week. So I got some, I got some money, a chunk of it. And, uh, I had been living in Georgia cause my husband was a southerner. And we had gone, he had wanted to go down south and we had gone. And I met this woman. First of all, we lived in a town where there were three women of a certain age, all named Margaret, who were all kind of little queens with their little queendoms. And they kind of kept tabs on each other and knew what each other were thinking and doing. Um, and they were quite powerful, all three well-heeled, um, old family, one a widow, one still married, and one never married. And one was a doctor. And um, so we were, we, we, were, we were down there and I met a woman in Roger's church, he was, he, he had a church, I, no way. Um, and she fascinated me because I'm somebody, I grew up <clears throat> in a kind of world of moral relevant, um, relativity where you sort of never say something's good or something's bad. You know, it's, mm -hmm. well, given this and in context, and I'm not sure how I feel, but I think this lady knew what she thought was right. She knew what she thought was wrong. She had a moral compass that was set on north and nobody could stop her. And I don't think in the nine years that I knew her, she ever once doubted herself or apologized for anything. She did what she thought was right. And I admired that. Being so wishy-washy myself and such a wimp, it was really kind of powerful. And so I wrote the three Miss Margarets about three. It sounds years. like a great TV series. Yeah, I wish it had gotten more attention. It never did. But I, uh, when I wrote the three Miss Margarets, I wrote about three women who, in an instance, take the law into their own hands. And uh, essentially, I wrote about vigilantes. Lefty lib that I am, I wrote about a vigilante. But I was sort of attracted to them. I like the certainty of them. Yes. That's great. And then you followed that up with, is it four others? 
Ladies yeah, the ladies Garrison. of Garrison Gardens, which uh, they they wanted a sequel, and um, so I wrote about I I spun off a very minor character who was very important in the town, but had not featured strongly in the three Miss Margarets. And then the third book, which was Family Acts, <clears throat> I wrote about an old theater, which actually was in Columbus. And Columbus is on some river, I can't remember which it is now. Um, but the steamboats used to come up and down it. And this theater was in a hotel. And what would happen at the turn of the last century is people would get off the th steamboat at night, they'd go and stay at the hotel, they'd have a meal, and then there would be a play in the theater. So the theater was this gorgeous old Victorian theater. And they had the dining room with all, I mean, it was a beautiful old building. And there was a community theater doing theater in there. I gather they've gotten a lot more fancy now. And so I wrote about the Springer Opera House, basically. I wrote about three generations of actors who worked in this old Southern theater. And that was the third book. Incredible. And you're working on, are you working on one now or just finished one? I, re, I recall back in March, I think you were working. Yeah, on I'm still working on it. Um, when I was young, I could work 10 hours a day. Hmm. I'm lucky if I do five. Yeah. I, so it's taking me a while. Do, uh, do you yeah. love the process? Oh, God, yeah. And this one, you know, there's a lot that's wrong about getting old, but uh, I really got brave with this. Um, I don't think I can pull this off, but then I never think I can pull them off. Um, this is so far out of my wheelhouse. It's like nothing I've ever even tried to write before. It's an idea I've had since 1994. And Raj kept saying, write it. It's a good idea. And I kept saying, you don't understand. It's not my thing. I, I, it's, it's, I'm the wrong person for it. It's a great idea. I agree with you. But I'm the wrong person to write it. It's out of my wheelhouse. It's out of my comfort zone. I, and I know nothing about the world that it's in. So um, after he died, I started noodling around with it. And um, I will be the happiest person in the world if I pull it off and the most surprised. Well, and it'll be a wonderful tribute to him. Oh God. Oh yeah. And, and it's kind of like, you know, for all the years that I kept saying, you no, don't be, yeah. I am a professional. I know my limitations. Stop. <laughs> and he would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, if, I mean, if, if I do pull it off, I am going to have to listen to the snark from up above. Yeah, but, you are. He's going to, I told you so, is going to come down. Oh, um, man. Oh, <laughs> we don't like the I told you so. <laughs> victory lap. <laughs> <laughs> um, fans, before I let you go, they Larry and many of the fans watching. Um, oh, sorry, not Larry. Sorry, Larry, I asked you that. Michael was asking where the heart is any memories oh, yeah. of that and james mitchell oh yeah jimmy mitchell jimmy you know jimmy worked in vaudeville before oh, wow. he became uh before he became a demille dancer and worked in movies 
And he gave me, I called him when I was doing the vaudeville portion of my book, Ladies of Garrison Gardens. And Jimmy gave me a couple of vaudeville stories, which I used. Oh, um, I yeah, yeah. Oh, Jimmy. Um, he was, he was amazing. He was another one of those warm, tender, kind, tough guys. And you he know? played your brother, right? Did Jimmy? Yeah, I think so. Jimmy and Diana Vanderblies, rest her soul. And um, yeah, we were the the Hathaway family. Am I got that right? I, I, your fans will tell me if you got that right, but I also didn't realize Rue McClanahan was in that series and here. Oh Keith yeah, Carroll. and Alice Alice Drummond was in it, and um, oh a bunch of yeah yeah, particularly after Paul and Claire um, took over, they 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 always wanted to hire uh, theater actors. People that's that didn't, that didn't was, kind of make the rounds of the songs. But that's what was so great about daytime television in New York. You could hire theater actors. Do you know who was in Where the Heart is playing a very small part? Raul Julia. Oh, wow. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. Love just Raul. a day. For, it was only for a day, but he was. Even then, you looked at him, you went, okay. Someday I'll be asking for your autograph. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So yeah. my last question, if the right yeah. part, if the right part came along today, would you take it? Oh, Lordy. Sure. Um, they'd have to go back to the old days of cue cards for me. I'm afraid. I don't know <laughs> if my memory would work. Um, I've been, yeah, I would. Sure. Yeah, it'd be fun. Is there, is, is there a dream role that you always wanted to play? A stage role? Well, when I was a kid, I always figured that I would die in the intermission of Romeo and Juliet when I was playing the nurse. <laughs> um, but I've gotten too old to play the nurse right now. Uh, Dream role? No, there isn't one. You know, I was always just so grateful to be employed. <laughs> I never really thought. I mean, I was so, I was trained to do the classics, and you know, bring great art to the rec theaters of America. And I always hated great art. But um, that's, that's why you brought such great performances to the roles in daytime. Because, oh, well, of that, that, because of that training. And, well, you know, the, the fans oh. have been delighted hearing from you today. They have oh, been thanks delighted. Oh, you guys. I, I can't see you because I've got like an Amazon <laughs> advertisement here in front of me. But thank you guys so much for listening. Well, Louise, just smile because I'm going to take a picture of you and I. I'll, t I'll count you down. One, two, and three. Thank you so much for doing this today. It was a pleasure. I'm so glad Alan, we got you uh, got you working. Oh, Alan Walker, <laughs> thank you. What a you're, wonderful thing. You're so welcome, Louise. You take care of yourself and let's stay in touch. Oh, please, absolutely. You, let's okay. be. Let's keep it going. You got take it. Take care. Have a great day. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks so much to Louise Schaefer. I'm so glad we were able to get this for all of you because I know you've all been asking. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do so down below. Turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And don't forget to join me tomorrow when my guest will be actor, writer, producer, and director Peter Mark Jacobson, who, along with Fran Drescher, created the hit series The Nanny and Happily Divorced. Have a great day, everybody. I will see you tomorrow.